here. Thank you for the opportunity to, uh, to have us here. It's a joy, it's a pleasure for us. And um, we want to share about what God is doing down there in, in Central America and Colombia. We, we just planted a, another church in Mexico City also, lastly. So we are we're having a, such a blessing uh, of being part of this movement of churches uh, all over Latin America. And I have the privilege to be the planter of, a, of the church in Bogota, Colombia. So I was born and raised in uh, El Salvador, and then uh, I moved to Colombia since seven years ago, uh, and it's, it's been such a blessing. I just want to show you some pictures of what's going on there. I'm just going to share this, this passage to you. But church is, is growing. Seven years has been so, so good, and church has been growing since then. And uh, we've gone through COVID. COVID actually was there also. Okay, so like, like here, was there, it was all over the world. And it hit very hard on, on Colombia, Bogota. Bogota is a city of 10 million people. So you can, you can imagine, it's really big, it's huge, and it's messy, and it's, uh, but it's a blessing because uh, it's full of people. So you can get to know a lot of people. So, Church is, is growing there, and after COVID, I mean, after the pandemic, uh, it's been a challenge to make the people come back to, uh, to church as well. So, uh, right now, uh, we've, we've done uh, a lot of work. That's the team of leadership that we have now, and, uh, and you can see the church uh, with all this new kind of space that you have to leave and it looks like this uh, but through this time of crisis through this time of COVID we've been able to see many people get saved and many, many people get baptized that I, I can tell I can show you some picture of people that come into church that happens like this they come to church and they say just getting to know the church because I've been part of the church for six months so far, but online. So this is my first time here. So this is these are families that have come just for the first time to be uh, with us in the church. We have baptized a lot of people, like 21 people during this this year of COVID. So it's been a blessing that we have reached a lot of people through YouTube and Facebook. If you have told me. I don't know, two years ago, you're gonna reach a lot of people by using YouTube. I would say no. <laughs> that's impossible. But that's that's the way it is right now. We're reaching a lot of people through YouTube and Facebook. And uh, and uh, I, I was talking with a new family there, and uh, a little kid comes like he's like seven years old, and he told me, you know. You are now one of my favorite YouTubers. <laughs> I'm not a YouTuber again. <laughs> yeah, but now, you know how it works now. I'm a YouTuber now. So uh, things are going, are going, are changing. The world is changing. But the gospel is the same. The word of the Lord is the same. We're reaching people with the gospel. We're preaching the word. So it's, it's wonderful. And, um, and what I want to share with you today, is, I think I have another picture of, of this. I want you please to go to Joshua. I'll open your Bible. What I would say, turn on your Bible, your phone. To Joshua chapter, chapter 5. Joshua chapter 5. This is going to read some verses and try to explain what's going on here. But you remember the story of Joshua. You're familiar with the story of Joshua. Joshua comes after Moses. I think sometimes we, we, we think that, I don't know, that Moses and, and Abraham and Paul, they all drink coffee together and we're friends. But you know that there is a line, a history line that uh, divides them from, I mean, centuries sometimes. And Moses and Joshua, they actually hang out together. And Moses was a mentor of, of, or a teacher of Joshua. And the purpose of Joshua, and the book of Joshua, what it's all about, it's conquering the whole land. Yeah. I mean, the 
promised land. Uh, it was to come and conquer the promised land. And I, and I think that the Lord gives us so many details in the book of Joshua to show us how we can have a comfort life. I mean, we have to comfort the promises of God for us too. Uh, it's not that something that I made up, it's something that the Bible tells us in, in Hebrews chapter 4, you're going to have to look for it, but in Hebrews chapter 4, it compares the comforting of land with us being in rest, with us trusting the promises of God. I propose to you that the book of Joshua is there to show us how we can comfort an abundant life, a life that has purpose, a life that is comforting the promises of God. We can have an adventure in this life. We can have a really, a really neat life, a, a wonderful life that God has given, God can give to us, and we can learn how to comfort that kind of life in the book of Joshua. The book of Joshua is, is about that. Uh, the book of Joshua is actual history. I mean, it really happened. It happened 3,400 years ago. Okay, it happened in, in, in the uh, 15th century before Christ. Um, but it, it actually is a picture of what we can live in our lives to comfort a, a, an abundant life, a, a blessed life, a, a life full of promises of God. So we can have that kind of life and we can learn how to have it in, in Joshua. And what would you say is the most famous uh, story in the book of Joshua. I'm making a poll here. What, what would you say is the most wonderful and uh, known history story in the book of Joshua? Jericho. Um, Jericho. Do, do, you, do you agree? Jericho? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the walls of Jericho, turn off, turning down the walls, and mm -hmm. you remember that? Okay, okay. That story is in chapter 6. Okay? It's in chapter, chapter 6. It says that you remember, you remember how many, how many times they went around Jericho so the walls would fall? How many times? Seven. Seven. Remember that? They were seven? Okay. It was actually 13. It was seven days, but six days, once uh, every day, and then in the seventh day, seven times. It was 13 times. In seven days. That's why we have seven in our minds. It was seven days, seven times the last day, six times. If you make the math, everybody's like, oh, I don't want to make the math. Okay, so 13 times. So after 13 times going in seven days, you remember that they blew the, the horns and the wolves uh, came down. It, it's, it's an amazing story. It's a great victory. It was. It was uh, a great victory for Joshua. It was amazing. Okay. I'm going to teach you something deep here. Okay. You know what happened before chapter 6? Chapter 5. <laughs> what happened before chapter 6? Chapter 5. And uh, I think that so many times we want to leave chapter 6. Mm -hmm. And see the, the walls come down. Be ready for great victories in our lives. And do great things for the Lord and, and, and experience great things in our lives. But I don't know if we are leaving chapter 5 in our lives. We want chapter 6, but we are not leaving chapter 5. Mm -hmm. What happened in chapter 5? Well, the people of Israel, Joshua and the people of Israel, needed to know that Jesus was with them. Period. That's it. They needed to, um, to understand that they were able to comfort the whole land because Jesus was with them. Chapter 5 is all about Jesus. Then we can go to Jericho. When we understand that it's all about Jesus, we can go to Jericho. In chapter 5, you see, well, let's read this chapter 5, please. Go to that verse that you are, you have cited there. Verse 10, chapter 5. 
we need to understand this so we can go to Jericho and conquer and, and, and have a victorious life. But we need to understand that it's about Jesus. Uh, I, I put this statement there. We can live by God's calling because we have Jesus. That's what we learn in Joshua chapter 5. Read with me, please, in verse 10. I'm going to read for you. It says, And the children of Israel encamped in Gilgal and kept the Passover on the 14th days of the month at even in the plains of Jericho. They are in front of Jericho. I want you to imagine what's going on there. Uh, they are in Jericho. They are working around. Could you imagine Joshua thinking, seeing all those big walls? It says that, that the, the city was closed, very closed, with huge walls, and they were walking around. And the plains of Jericho says they're looking at those walls and saying, man, how are we going to do this? I mean, this is impossible. Mm -hmm. we, we cannot, we are not able, we don't have all the army and the strategy, we, we, we don't know what to do. And I think Joshua is walking around saying, man, I, I don't know what, what we're going to do. How are we going to conquer and I think so many times we are like that in our lives. I mean, so many challenges in front of us, not only in ministry, but in lives. I'm walking around saying, I don't know what the future is bringing. I don't know what, I don't know how we're going to make this happen. And I think they're walking like this. And it said that they, they had to celebrate the Passover. Remember that? They celebrated the Passover. And then it says, verse 11, and they did eat of the old corn of the land on the morrow after the Passover. Remember that is after the Passover. And living cakes and parched corn in the south same day. And the manna ceased on the morrow after they had eaten of the old corn of the land. Neither have the children of Israel manna anymore. But they did eat of the fruit of the land of Canaan that year. Okay, that's, that's it. Then it says in verse 13, And it came to pass, when Joshua was by Jericho, that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, there stood a man over and against him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went unto him and said unto him, Are thou for us or for our adversaries? And he said, Nay, that's, that's an interesting answer. Are you for us or for all of us? Nay, no. I had a friend that we went, we went eating together to a fast food restaurant. I think it was a McDonald's or something. And the lady in the, uh, there, she said, do you want this for here to go? No. <laughs> that's what we're asking. Do you agree? From here to go, no? And she was like, what do I do? <laughs> That's the answer. Are you for us or against us? No. I think we're going to learn something there. And it says, verse 14, <clears throat> he said, Nay, but as captain of the host of the Lord, am I now come? And Joshua fell on his face on the earth and did worship and said to him, what said my Lord unto his servant? And the captain of the Lord's host said unto Joshua, Loose thy shoe from off thy foot, for the place where on thou standest is holy, and Joshua did so. What, what do we learn here? The first thing we learn here is that it's, it's all about Jesus. Uh, is that God has given us all we need to comfort. We really have all we need to come. We, we can have that beautiful life that we can have that victorious life. We can live a life that is worth living because God has given all we, all we need. I mean, we really have because we have Jesus. And Jesus is our foundation. What we learn here, I told you that chapter 5 is all about Jesus. Jesus is our provision. Uh, what I'm saying is, I want you to see here that we have three things here. Three things here. First thing they, they, they celebrate is the Passover. Jesus is our Passover. 
Do you remember that Jesus is the last of God? Because he is our Passover. It says, the Bible says in John 1, 36, that John the Baptist said, here comes the Lamb of God. <coughs> he is the Lamb of God. And it says in Revelation 5, 12, that he is our Lamb that was slain for us. Because he is our Passover. You know, he is our provision in our salvation. Why we can have a beautiful life, a life that has a meaning and a purpose? Because Jesus is our Passover. He is our provision. He provided for us our salvation. You and I, we cannot save ourselves. But then, Jesus came as our Passover. We celebrate our Passover. But then it says that they, they uh, did eat from the fruit of the land. Remember? Mm -hmm. It was like this. They celebrated the Passover. They killed the lamb. They slain the lamb. So they celebrated the Passover. And the next day, they began to eat from the fruit of the land. That's a great news for them because all they had eaten so far it was manna. Okay, follow me here. Mm -hmm. For 40 years, these people was in the desert and everything they, they ate for 40 years was manna. Was manna. Uh, I, I, we don't know exactly how manna uh, would taste like or would be like exactly. But it was a kind of cornflakes, maybe, or something like that, it says the Bible. So, manna was everything they ate during 40 days, uh, during 40 years. Now they come to the land, and they eat the old corn from the land and the fruit of the land. Jesus is the fruit mm. of the land. He is the seed that dies so he can bear fruit for us. He is our satisfaction. Hmm. Jesus is our satisfaction. He says, John 12, 24, remember? He says, I am the seed that comes to the ground, dies, and bears much fruit for you. Jesus is the produce of the land, but he is our man. It says here that when they ate the fruit of the land, the man ceased. No more man. Man. Well, fell from the from from heaven. You know how it worked. He fell from heaven, and every morning you should go pick your manna for the day. You you couldn't keep the manna for the next day. Okay. So every day you want to have your man. Okay. That single day is stuck. No more manna for the people of Israel. They were ready to eat the fruit of the land. What we learn? Jesus is the Passover. Mm -hmm. Jesus is the fruit of the land. Jesus is the man. Jesus is everything. Yeah. They needed to understand. Okay, you're gonna you're gonna go to Jericho. You're gonna conquer the land. Okay, you need to understand. Jesus is your best provision. Why can we respond to a holy call? Why can we live a life that is worth living? Why do we think we can have a, a beautiful life, an adventure in this life? Because we have Jesus. Mm -hmm. He is the sovereign, He is the producer of the land, and He is the man that we need. He is everything. And when we have Jesus, we have everything. Yeah. So we're ready. Uh, you know that when I was, when I was, we were being called to go to Bogota some years ago. Well, actually, it was like nine years ago. And uh, we were in the, media, in the middle of that calling. And then my daughter, I, I have three, three children, three kids. One is 15 years old. And one is the other one, his name is Raul. And David Jr., he is 13 years old. And my baby girl, she's 11 years old. Uh, she became uh, 11 yesterday. She was celebrating her birthday yesterday. And 11, 13, and 15, you can tell my life is smooth. The party of the day. I have a lot of things going on in my house. So 15, 13, and, and, and 11. But when my, my baby girl, she was 20 months old, not even two years old, uh, Camilla, when she was Almost two years old, uh, she got sick with cancer, and uh, and we were exactly in the middle of our calling to go to Bogota. Hmm. Okay, wow. God was calling us to go to Bogota, and we were thrilled about that that plan, and we were planning the whole thing. And then my daughter.
daughter got cancer. But the cancer was not the bad part. Okay, I, I always say that cancer and daughter shouldn't be in the same sentence. Yeah. No, no, no. yeah. But it was like that. So, my daughter, 20 months old, got cancer. But the cancer was not the bad part, but she developed a syndrome because of the cancer. Okay, that, that syndrome is called uh, OMS, Obstacle Myoclonus Syndrome. Or you can find the syndrome of Kingsborn. The point is that overnight, um, our baby girl that she was running around, playing around all, all over the house, suddenly, overnight, she couldn't stand up. She could, she was shaking all the time. She was, her eyes were moving like this without control all the time. And that she couldn't hold her head up, so she was like this all the time. Overnight, I mean, it was from Thursday to Friday. Mm. Uh, we put it in a, uh, on her bed on Thursday, and the next morning she was like this. It, 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 is, it has been the most shocking experience in my life. Just watch this, is, what's going on? Mm. So we called the doctors, and, uh, and they said, you have to run and do some uh, MRI and all these tests and exams because for sure that's something in, the, in her brain. We did, and to make a long story short, uh, a doctor, a doctor there in Salvador, he said, okay, there's no tumor in the brain, there's no aneurysm, there's nothing wrong physically in the brain, so I think, this, this was his diagram, I think it's uh, King, Kingsborn syndrome. And uh, I read, like a paragraph of that, Google it. And when you Google it, those things, you find out that two things. One, there's no information about it. Nobody knows about that. And the second thing you find out is the prognosis is really bad. She won't be able to walk, she won't be able to talk, she she might have to her all her life long. So it's a disaster. That, that's why you found when you Google it. So when we were, we were in desperate, I mean, we were, wow, what's going on here? Mm -hmm. And he said, he said this, his doctor said, I think it's OMS. I don't know how to treat it. Nobody knows how to treat it in Latin America. Uh, if I were you, I would go to uh, the United States or anywhere else, good luck. That was it. <coughs> My wife and I, we were like, so we started uh, talking with uh, doctors here in the United States, our friends connected with, you know how it works, a friend connects with a friend, with a friend, with a friend, we started talking with doctors, neurologists here in the United States. And when I heard this neurologist in the United States say, uh, I think my daughter has OMS, Oxycontin's myoclonus syndrome. And when he said, say what? That was scary. When an American doctor tells me, say what? What are you talking about? We don't know about that. Wow, that, that, that was scary. That was in the middle of our calling the book. I come to I came to my wife in the middle of this mess. And I said, uh, I, I called her Seca. That that means skinny. And I know that in English doesn't doesn't sound very good, okay? But in, in, in Spanish it's, it's very lovely. So I said, Seca, God is calling us to the mission field. And our baby was in the hospital, shaking like this, and I said, God is calling us to the mission field. And she, in a very spiritual way, she said, Give me a break. <laughs> <laughs> Going to the mission field. I'm thinking about how we're gonna do with a baby girl here. And I said, maybe you should try. It. Okay, yeah. So I went to our pastors who didn't see that it's here, and I said, you know what? God is calling out to the mission field. He's still calling us. And Julio said, Man, you're crazy. You have to be thinking in your diet right now. And I said, Yeah. Maybe. You're right. And I said, 
same thing with Steve and Steve said, man, you're crazy. Well, I'm crazy too. So I, I understand you why you're thinking like that. You know what's the point? Weeks later, uh, my wife came to me and said, and, and this is powerful. She said, you know what? I've been praying. I have been spending time with the Lord. And I can tell you, I have to this conclusion, she said. We can leave our lives around to heal us disease. Or we can leave our lives around God's call. And I want to be around God's call. So if, if God is calling us to go to the God is enough. Jesus is our provision. I don't know how we're going to do it. But God can heal our daughter. In El Salvador, or in Colombia, in the United States, whatever. Jesus is enough. When you can, when she came to this conclusion, when you come to that conclusion, that is power. That's life changing. Yeah. 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 That's life changing. Next week, a goal was wild to come to Houston here in the United States. Uh, we don't know how. We don't have a clue how God arranged the whole thing. Only five doctors in the United States, only five neurologists had a clue of how to treat my doctor. Only five. Because it's a really rare disease. It's one in 10 million children. One in 10 million children. So, uh, you know, I work when one in 10 million, nobody, nobody has it. So nobody studied about it. Nobody does research about it. Nobody, nobody know what to do. Only five doctors had a clue of what to do with my daughter. And one has to be there in Houston, Texas Children's Hospital. And she was treated there in Texas Children's Hospital, uh, fully covered by, by that hospital. We, we, we didn't take even the, the American tickets. We didn't pay them. I mean, the whole thing. Uh, uh, I remember going to, uh, to this doctor. <coughs> I, I can talk about this story for the whole morning, but I, I'm coming to this doctor. You know how we're these, these doctors uh, are like rock stars. I mean, you, you don't come to, I don't know, LeBron James' door and say, hey, we can play basketball together. You, you don't do that. <laughs> okay, it's, it's, it's kind of like that. Okay, you don't come to this doctor and say, hey, I have my daughter here. We didn't treat her. It's, it's not like that. It's, it was a miracle to, to just be in touch with this doctor. And, uh, and we came to here to, to, to him, and he said, don't worry. Don't worry about money. Don't worry about the treatment. We're going to cover the whole thing. The hospital, the Texas Children's Hospital, this huge hospital there, we're going to cover the whole thing. Wow. And I was treated there, and got healed. And now you, can, you, 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 you should see my, my daughter, the ones that have been down there, have known my daughter. Uh, she's running around, she's a normal kid, she is completely healed, and, uh, and sometimes I just looking for the bottom to turn her off. I mean, she's always <laughs> learning, and learning, and she's a normal kid. But, but everything began with my wife saying, tell me, I've been with the Lord, and I, I really think that Jesus is enough. If we have Jesus, we have it. We can come for Jericho because we have Jesus. He's our Passover. He's our fruit. He's our manna. He's everything. We have everything. And when you understand that, you understand that everything that comes from Jesus is it, good. We will not be able to respond to a holy coming if we don't understand that Jesus is all we need. We won't be able to come for a life that is full of his promise, that is full of purpose, we don't come to a conclusion that Jesus is all we need. Uh, sometimes we see ourselves so um, that we come so short of what it really takes to, to live a, a wonderful life. I mean, if I see my life, you, you would agree. If I see my mind, my own life, I see, man, I'm lacking so many things in my life to conquer uh, an abundant life. But it's not about me, it's about Jesus. You see, when you understand that everything that, that you can comfort, even God Jesus is with you, that is faith. And
and Israel have to understand this before going to Jericho. It is not possible to go to Jericho if you don't understand he is your prophet, he is your Passover, he is your fruit, uh, the fruit of the land, he is your manna, he is everything. Yeah. We have Jesus, we have everything, okay, let's go, let's do it. We can come for a beautiful life, not because of what we do, but because of what Jesus did. Mm. And when we understand that, man, that, that's powerful. The Bible says that everything good comes from Him, or from Him, and through Him, and to Him, are all things to be in the glory forever. Amen. If we want to respond to a holy God and live a life that is worth it, we need to understand that everything comes from Him and is for Him. And that's, that's <coughs> why we need That's why. Chapter 5 is before chapter 6. Wow. That's, That's why they needed to understand this. But the second thing they needed to understand is that Jesus is our provision, but Jesus is our prince. Uh, I like the way King James put it is remember that he, here comes Joshua. Remember the story? We just read it. Here comes Joshua. He raises his eyes and sees a man coming with a, with a uh, sword in his hand, okay? That is Jesus. Mm -hmm. That is Jesus in the Old Testament, yep. okay? He is actually Jesus. And uh, here comes Jesus with a sword in his hand. And you know, uh, Joshua is thinking about being in war. He's going to he's gonna conquer this land. So he thinks one, one of two things. One, maybe he is one of my men, part of my, my army, and if he is going around here, okay, that's disobedient because I have told everybody to stay in the involved. So, why are you doing this? What, what are you doing here? That, that's his question, okay? Are you part of my army? What are you doing? You shouldn't be moving with a, with a sword around, okay? This is, enemy is going to look at you and they're going to come. So, are you part of my team? What are you doing here? Or are you a foe? Are you an enemy? If you're an enemy, you know what Joshua was doing. He was not really him. He was like, are you an enemy? We're going to fight. Okay, that's that's the two options. Are you part of my army? What are you doing here? Are you an enemy? I'm going to fight with you. Okay, that's, that's the point. And Jesus comes here and says, no. And I understand the, the, the answer of Jesus. Are you, are you a part of my army? Are you under my command? That's what Joshua is saying. Are you under my command? Or are you an enemy? And he says, no. No. Not, none of those options. I'm not under your command. I'm Jesus. Hmm. I'm not under your command. I'm not part of your army. No. And I'm not your enemy. Understand this. I'm the captain. Mm. Mm. And King James used the word captain. I'm the captain. In Spanish, in Spanish, in the Spanish version, it says, I'm the prince. Mm. And I like the word because it's with a P, so you can follow it. <laughs> it's a provision, but it's our prince. But I like the word. I am the prince of the army of the Lord. He is our captain. Okay. Young people are here. Listen to this. We are under the command of Jesus. We don't tell Jesus what to do. He tells us what to do. And when we understand that, everything changes. Because sometimes we have learned that we can tell Jesus what to do. Lord, we need you to do this for me. And if you could do it tomorrow, we'll be back. <laughs> Sometimes we get used to it, but we as adults, right. we usually pray like that. Lord, pray you to bless my business. Yeah. Please bless my children. Amen. Okay? And we say this word as a magical word in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh -huh. Okay? And we think that we are given kind of orders to Jesus. We, we are in the 
wrong path there. Jesus comes to Joshua and says, Joshua, you are not a man. I am the prince. I am in charge. This is not, this is not what you are going to conquer. I am going to conquer. I am going to use you. And when you put that in the right perspective, then everything changes. What, what I'm proposing to you is that we will not be able to respond to a holy calling. We don't understand that Christ is our time. How do we, how do we get to, to have a beautiful life? Uh, how do we confer uh, an abundant life? And that is, how do we do respond to God's holy calling? When we understand that He is in the mind. He is the prince. He says what to do, and we do it. You know that. It is, I love the, the question that uh, Joshua makes to, to the Lord. He says there in verse uh, 14. Read verse 14 there in your Bible, please. And he says, May, but as captain of the host, as prince of the host of the Lord, am I now come. And Joshua fell on his face. Unto earth, that is worship. That what we what we know that is Jesus. He comes to his face. Uh, you know that an angel would not receive worship. That's what we know is Jesus. So he fell on his face on earth and did worship and said to him, "This is the question. What said my Lord unto his servant? You see the position? Yes. Yeah. He is the Lord." I am the servant. He commands, I obey. When we have the right perspective, we can conquer third. Wow. We can conquer anything that comes. Um, I remember being uh, in this in the middle of this uh, pandemic. You know how how work, how the world changed. Overnight, because of this pandemic, we were locked down down there in, 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 in Bogota, March of 2020. They said, no meetings, no more, I mean, you remember, no airplanes, no bus, uh, no buses, no massive uh, transportation, no churches, no meetings. And, uh, and I was talking with Alex, he is the other pastor there in, in, in Colombia, and I said to him, hey Alex, we, are, we have to close our facilities this time, yeah. Okay, we are going online this Sunday. And he said, okay, have you ever uh, done it? And I said, no, have you? No, okay, let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way it worked for everyone, but for all of us, I mean, schools and everything was like that. But that was our conversation, it was Tuesday. And I remember talking to him, okay, and What's first step? I don't know. Okay, let's do it. Okay. And we're gonna go live this Sunday. And it was and it was like God. And we started to learn new things. Start to why do you have to ask, why do we do what we do? I mean, why do we do this effort? Because we are called by God. He has told us to do this, and we just obey. Mm. We don't know exactly. What are we going to do, or how are we going to do it? But well, we just obey. He's our commander, and we obey. We just, we just do it. So remember this question: What does the Lord tell us, uh, me as a servant? Is the same question that Paul did there in Acts chapter nine. Remember, remember how Paul comes to know Jesus, and he finds with. Uh, with Jesus in his road to Damascus, and he says this, the Bible says this, and he, trembling and astonished, said the same question, Lord, what will that help me to do? What do, what do I do? What do you want me to do? I challenge you, during this week, that's a good question to me, to the Lord. Lord, what do you want me to do? What, what do you want? I mean, maybe it's not going overseas 
to preach the gospel right now, but what do you want me to do? Maybe it's obeying my parents. Maybe it's reading my Bible. Maybe it's uh, being part of a mission, a short-term mission trip that Rick was inviting to do. Or maybe it's to start, I don't know, giving my resources for the Lord. Or, I don't know. Or maybe it's talking to my friends about Jesus. I don't know. I don't know what's going to do. But the, the question is still real. I mean, Lord, what do you want me to do? That's exactly what Joshua was telling the Lord, the prince of the host of the Lord. He was watching him and said, Lord, what do you want me to do? That's, that, that's still the question. Lord, what will thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou do. The Lord will always answer that because he tells us what to do. You know what? Why do we do what Jesus tells us to do? Because he's worth it. Yeah. So, here it comes. The prince of the of the Lord. And Joshua was right. And he said, you are worth it. Tell me what to do. I'm going to do it because you are worth it. Because you are precious to me. Yeah. When you understand that Jesus is precious to me, and I'm going to do whatever you say I'm going to do, everything, everything changes. The Bible says there in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 7, And to you, therefore, which believe he is precious. If Jesus is not worth it, if Jesus is not precious to you, mm. it's difficult that you're going to say, Lord, tell me what to do, because you're not worth it. Uh, one, one of the things that I learned when I was very young, uh, when I was 21 years old, my brother passed away. He was 23 years old. Okay? So I was 21, he was 23. And he had this brain aneurysm. So he passed away, I mean, with no symptoms. Uh, we didn't know he had this brain aneurysm. He was just watching TV one day, and then suddenly he just passed away. You can imagine how shocking that was for my family. It was just my brother and I. Uh, so he passed away that, that way, my mom. My mom was the only one that was in the house with him. So she took the body, thinking that he had a heart attack or something, and she she put him in the car, and she just ran to, to, the, to the hospital but with a dead body, but she, she thought she was doing something. And, uh, and he, was, he was dead. And uh, that, that, is, that was life changing for us. I mean, it was, and I remember being with the Lord. Christ, he was a man of God. He was a worship leader in a church. He was a, a really, a, a man of God that is he was the Lord. But it was such a, an impact in our life. I, I remember being with the Lord there in San Salvador. In San Salvador, you have the beach like 40 minutes away from you. I mean, it's pretty close. So I was in the beach praying and crying and saying, Lord, Maybe I am the, the petition number, I don't know, 120,000, any number on your list. But here am I, just harping that my brother just passed away. And I remember the Lord took me to this passage and said, you know what? And to their fool, which believe is precious. I am enough, and I have a purpose in your life, yes. even though you're going through this difficulties. When you have a purpose in your life, anything, you can, come, you can overcome anything, yes. because it's precious. Yes. It's worth living for you. It's worth it. And when you understand that you're ready to serve, you're ready to see the greatness of God because He's precious. And he wants 
to, to give you a purpose to live, his pressures. But unto them which uh, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders is allowed, the same is uh, made of head, the head of the partner. Uh, there's a story. There's a story of uh, they say it's a real story that in the 12th century it comes a small army with a man in command, and they came to comfort a big kingdom there in Europe. And the king of that kingdom sent a messenger to this army. And he said, you know what? He said to the commander there, you know what? The king says that you should stop this. Your army is really small, and we have a huge army. So if you surrender right now, we're going we're gonna to keep you alive. But we're going to keep you in the high tower uh, in a the jail there. But we're going to keep you alive. Okay? This is your only opportunity. So surrender. But the commander did this, he called a soldier and he said, you, come here. And the soldier came and said, jump over the, uh, jump over the, no, you know, wrist, there. And he jumped and he killed himself. And he called the other soldier and said, come here, okay, take his knife and put it inside of you and he stabbed himself. And he did. In the act here. And he killed himself. And the commander said to the, to the messengers, tell our king that we have few soldiers, small, but these men are willing to do anything I tell them to do. They will do whatever else I tell them to do. And we're going to go comfort your kingdom, and I'm not going to keep you alive. I'm going to kill you. Go tell your king that. They said the next day, the next day, they were comforting that man because of that. And he ended up with this phrase, we will suffer, but we'll never be far. I think that sometimes we don't look like those kinds of soldiers with our commanders, with our friends. I think that the difference that Christianity during all the history has made is that we have been Christians that are under our prince command, and if he says jump, we jump. And if he says go, we go. And that has been the thing that has changed history because we will suffer, but we will not give up. That's that's exactly the kind of attitude that we should have with our commanders. And you know, this commander was cruel. Our prince is a good king. Amen. Our prince is a good commander. He knows the plan that he has for you. Plans for good. Not to ruin your life, but to give you purpose. And sometimes we don't have that attitude. What is the right question? Lord, what do you want me to do? That's the way to respond to his calling. There's this uh, this verse that sometimes I don't I don't think we we, we read it like we should. It says the Bible in Philippians chapter one verse twenty nine. For it has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in him but also suffer for his sake. Lord, what do you want me to do? I'm going to do it. Whatever it is, whatever it takes, you are precious. You are worth it. Now we understand. Before chapter six, we needed to be chapter five. Before going to comfort Jerry, we needed to understand that Jesus is everything. Jesus is our Passover. Jesus is our produce of the land. Jesus is our manna. Jesus is our praise. Jesus is everything. So Jesus tell me what to do. I'm going to do. Need to raise the bar and live like that. There's a songwriter, you know him, uh, maybe you have heard his music, Stephen Kutcher Chapman. Stephen Kutcher Chapman wrote a song that's very old, very old. You can tell my, my age, 
because of this, this uh, song is one of my favorites. Uh, it is called For the Sake of the Call. For the Sake of the Call. Back there in the nights, okay? Most of you uh, here in this room, maybe we're not born yet. Back there in the nights. But still, he wrote this. He wrote this in, this, in, his, in his song. It says, We will abandon it all. He says, For the Sake of the Call. He says, No other reason at all but the sake of the he says, simply because he is Jesus that yes. calls. Yes. And I agree with him. Simply because the prince is calling us to God. What the we're going to do. I think that we don't understand Christianity many times like that. Okay, Jesus, whatever you whatever you come to me, simply because you are talking to God, I'm going to do it. I don't know what it's going to be. But simply because it is Jesus who called. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. That story that I'm going to tell you. Do you know how? Uh, you know how the first family, the first Colombian family was born for the church there in Bogota. I'm going to tell you how we get to know the first family in Bogota. Okay? Okay? And I'm going to tell you how. How do you plant a church? Okay? And go away with this. How do you plant a church? If you want to become a church planter, three steps to plant a church. It's very easy. Number one, okay? Number one, number one. Write down a vision. Write down a vision. I mean, I want to do this. Number two, step number two. Write down a strategy. Okay? We're going to do this, and then this, and then this. And number three, third step. Write down a plan for the first year. Okay? That's very simple. That's what you do. And then go to the mission field. Take all that that you have written. Do it by this. <laughs> and go to the classroom. <laughs> because you quickly realize that it's not about your plan. Yes. It's about God's plan. Mm -hmm. You're in the mission field saying, whoa, this is completely different from what I wrote. Because the first family that we want for Christ there, it was because I was in my apartment, my flat. It was in the third floor, okay? I was taking a shower, and then the janitor of the building came to our door, and he was knocking on my heart. Sir, you have a leak, a water leak. Sir, you have a water leak. And I said, no, I don't have a water leak. And I, I ended and, and my shower uh, got, Called and, uh, and went out to the door and said, The second floor apartment is completely flooded. Because we were taking a shower in the first floor, the second floor apartment is completely flooded. And I was like, Man, maybe. And it was a long shot. I mean, <laughs> not because of that. So I came to the second floor and it was a complete mess. You can imagine that. I mean, the, the ceiling was like tearing down, the floor was popping up, the walls were like, I mean, they, they had flat TVs all over the place, like the screens all over the place, and it was, it was a disaster. The lady there was crying and, 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 and shaking. She was in shock because everything was destroyed in her apartment. And, uh, and I said, Oh, I'm your neighbor of the third floor, so I'm sorry. <laughs> so you say when you can find out that it's because of your view. I, obviously, it was not my fault. It was because the building company didn't connect all the pipelines in the right way. Whatever it is, the point is that I come here to this family, and the building company was going to respond for the whole thing. Insurance company was taking care of the whole thing. She was coming down. But even though I'm from El Salvador and moved to Colombia, and even though we speak, both countries we speak Spanish, our accent is really different. Like uh, Southern accent and Northern accent here in the United States, or something like that. So my accent revealed that I'm not from Colombia. So she said, you're not from here, you speak weird. So you're not from here, no, I'm not from here. Where are you from? I, I come from South. First week, there you go. I come from South. What are you doing? What 
brought you here? Well, we teach the Bible. Uh, we come here to teach the Bible. And she said this. She said this. We need to pray. We need to pray. My husband and I, we need to pray for somebody to come and teach us the Bible. Mm -hmm. And for months. And we have not found anybody. Wow. Will you please teach us the Bible? Mm -hmm. Next Sunday, they were at my house. Uh, the first service of our church was at my house. So just a small group of people there. They were there. They got saved. They were uh, disciples. They got baptized. And now they are part of our leadership there in the church. Awesome. Ten years ago. I don't know how creative could you be. But trust me, I didn't put in my plan.